Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Chronicler Podcast channel. Episode 26, Death of Han Wudi, Decline of the Han, Enter the New. So Han Wudi died at the age of 71 in 86 BC. He reigned for a whopping 56 years, the longest record for the reign of any emperor in China, and that would continue up until the Qing Emperor Kangxi over 1,000 years later. But in terms of records, he did set records in other areas too. For example, territorial expansion of Han culture, which would last until the Tang Dynasty. Furthermore, he also set up Confucianism as the state philosophy or religion, which stayed up until the fall of the Qing Dynasty. Now, other religions were obviously present in China as well, such as Taoism and Buddhism, but I'll do an entire episode on the Silk Road and what travelled to China on the road, Buddhism being probably the most important thing. Or certainly the most significant. Not important. Significant. But of course, as soon as the Emperor died, the Han Dynasty pretty much began to decline. The biggest reason being that all of these military campaigns and heavy taxes were now beginning to add up. And it was just a case of the cost beginning to outweigh the benefits really. So pretty much after Han Wudi died, the Han Dynasty pretty much said no more conquering, almost like a Pax Romana if you want to compare it to ancient Rome. We have basically reached the full capacity of our boundaries and can no longer expand further. Now speaking of Rome, it was during this time that you would have the rise of the Caesars and the fall of the Roman Republic, which would then be replaced by the Roman Empire. There were other problems too. After the rise of such a prominent figure who controlled so much within the imperial court and who indeed centralised power to himself, it begs the question, what will happen after he's gone? And this was on the mind of lots of people. And as a result, when the new emperor was crowned, Emperor Lu Fuin, also called Emperor Zhao, there was a bit of a power grab, as the new head of state simply couldn't control his imperial court. With the lack of control and the sudden expansion of administrators for the new regime in the newly conquered territories allowed corruption to become a real problem within the imperial treasury. So the governmental concerns and the economic concerns pretty much tied hand in hand and the dynasty began to decline. What this allowed to happen though was the rise of a new figure within the political spectrum and his name is Wang Mang. Now I'm not gonna lie, I fast forwarded a little bit in time here. Eight new Han emperors have been and gone since the rise of uh, Wang Meng. Well, actually, it's more like seven, as Wang Meng convinces the eighth emperor since Han Wudi, Liu Yin, who didn't even get a posthumous title because he abdicated for his new powerful minister. That's a sad state of affairs. But yeah, Wang Meng, a great guy or a power hungry tyrant. This is the thing, there's a lot of debate around Wang Meng. He gets known as Xiao Ren, which literally means a villain. A guy who usurped power and took over the Han Dynasty and he's the reason why it collapsed so bad. But then there's other people who suggest that Wang Meng actually tried to help the Dynasty. Well, he didn't try to help it because he did usurp power, but he tried to help everyone in the realm and the only way he seemed to do this was through usurping power. But more on that later. So Wang Meng did convince many people to join his side and dethrone in the Han with great ideals. Or did he do this with the point of a sword? Well, let's find out. Wang Meng was born in 45 BC, to not the worst of circumstances. His family were descendants of the former state of Qi's nobility, and they were rather close with the imperial family. So you could argue that Wang Meng came from a certain degree of comfort. He wasn't exactly a peasant who worried about crop failures or anything, that's for sure. However, Wang Meng was a low rank considering his heritage, but it didn't stop Wang Meng from rising through the ranks. Now you must be asking, why did he rise through the ranks? The main reason is that the Wang family had a bit of a bad rep for being wasteful. For example, his cousins had competitions on who could spend the most money in a single day. I'll just leave up to your imagination what they would spend their money on. Whereas Wang Meng was different. He didn't dress like a flash noble, you know, with the expensive hats, the cheap jewellery and the finest silk money goodbye. Wang Meng dressed like a humble Confucian scholar, and indeed, 
That's what he seemed to aspire to. Whilst his family members went out and got smashed on the drink, Wang Lang would study the classics. Being a staunch Confucian helped Wang Lang to understand the concept of Xiao Xin, which means filial piety to one's parents. Wang Lang showed great respect to his peers and great respect among scholars and government officials, who began to take notice of the man. Wang Lang, with his background and connections to the royal family and his studies, made him a strong candidate when government posts came up, which they did. Wang Lang then began to use these posts and he managed to make some changes in the government. But what's interesting about Wang Lang is that the higher rank he got, it seemed like he became more humble. He sounds like the modern day president of Uruguay at this rate, who literally lives in a shack. Wang Lang was similar. I mean, he didn't live in a shack, but he didn't spend any of the extra money on lavish parties, expensive jewellery, hunting trips or even concubines. Speaking of which, he only kept one. But instead, he donated most of his earns to scholarly work and to the peasantry. This of course granted him even more respect amongst the nobility within the imperial court at the time. By the time Wang Lang Ta- was 37, he rose to the highest rank within the court and had become very close to the emperor, Emperor Chang. The guy who had been promoting Wang Lang died in 7 CE and left his son Liu Yin as named successor, with Wang Lang as his regent. Now everyone thought that this was a great idea, but it actually turned out to be the end of the dynasty, temporarily. Wang Lang looked at the world around him, seeing that seeing what was going on, for example, a ruined economy and a corrupted government, alongside with a heavily taxed peasantry, then decided to take the ultimate step. He would use his position as regent to dethrone the young emperor Liu Ying. This is where the debate comes in this respect. What Wang Lang does as emperor hits with a lot of backlash at the time and was later demonised as the horrible usurper that the restored Han Dynasty said he was. But then you have scholars who praised his efforts. Even Mao Zedong praised him as the first socialist ruler of China. Now I'm not going to get into the politics of today, but I mean, the fact that Mao Zedong said this about the guy means a lot. It shows that he did have a big impact, even though his reign wasn't exactly long. So speaking of that, what was the name of his new dynasty going to be? He called it the Xin Dynasty. Xin in Chinese literally means new. So in other words, he called it the New Dynasty. The name is rather fitting to be fair. The Han had been 200 years old by this stage and Wang Lang from 9 CE to 23 CE did a grand total of 14 years. Not even as long as the Qin Dynasty. And to be fair, it probably didn't have such a great impact like the Qin did, particularly because the Han get back into power after the death of Wang Lang and his newly created dynasty. So now, on with the reforms that Wang Lang tries to make. To try and rejuvenate the dwindling Han economy, or should I say, the Xin economy now, Wang Lang decided to take on a more socialist side of things. As, he, as the praises from Mao may have suggested already, For example, he created almost like a Robin Hood tax. In other words, he taxed the rich heavier than ever before, in order to reinvest the money into poorer communities. Further to this, he also gave the poor loans from the state to help them in times of famine. However, his two most memorable reforms were these. The first is nationalise all land in the empire. And when I say nationalise, I mean nationalise. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor, the land belonged to the state from 9 AD. Wang Lang even wrote, The strong possess lands by the thousands of Mu, while the weak have nowhere to place a needle. Now, I said Mu, that's tree by the way, just so you know. What he's referring to here is the fact that wealthy nobles and merchants have managed to buy up all of China's land and then basically held the peasantry to ransom. If there was a famine and the peasants couldn't pay their rent, they were evicted. All of this Wang Lang tried to change. By ensuring all land belonged to the state, as some of you may be thinking, why bother? Why bother helping working people when nobody else would? And when they couldn't even defend themselves? And yeah, you'd be right. But he did this, I believe, 
for three reasons. The first is that it let people see that Wang Wang was benevolent, and by de demonstrating he was better than Han emperors, he had the mandate of heaven. Also, Wang Wang believed that he would help the economy recover, and therefore the realm would be more prosperous. And finally, it coincided with Confucian values, which Wang Wang was all about. I think it is important to note here too that in Han China, the social hierarchy was seen as in different ways to the West. At the top you'd have the imperial family and lords, like everywhere else in the world, but the people who came second were the peasantry, the farmers. These people, the Chinese believed, were the backbone of society, and without them everyone would starve. At the bottom were the merchants. The merchant classes were always looked down upon by Chinese scholars and nobles alike, just because they don't actually produce anything. They make money from moving goods around the world. And whilst doing that, they make lots of money, and apparently, they ripped people off a lot. This in turn allowed the merchant classes to rise in terms of wealth, to the same levels of nobility, which of course, the nobility didn't really like. Then of course, after they've got all of this wealth, and they've got land, and they've got private resources, they could then bribe their way into government, which Wang Wang didn't like at all. Wang Wang also tried to reintroduce a fantasy that scholars believed to be true at the time, which is the way farming was conducted during the times of the Zhou Dynasty. This was called the Jin system, the idea being that farmers get about five acres of land each, they would farm the fields and arrange them to look like the character Jin. What then would happen is that the state would collect the crops in the middle of the character, and that would be the tax, which was around 10%. Wang Man believed that five acres was enough to support one family. It should have been enough, right? <laughs> right? But it turned out he was pretty wrong. Very wrong. People began to struggle rather quickly. So, how many people has Wang Man managed to piss off so far? The rich, merchants, and farmers. Does the list continue? Uh, not really. But there is one other drastic reform that Wang Man tries to implement, which is worth mentioning. This is the reforms on currency. To monopolize government control on gold, Wang Man ordered all of the gold that could be collected to be brought to the capital and to be stored in the imperial palace. Now note, this wasn't for him to use on his own pleasures, but it was more like a bank that stores its gold reserves. That included all of the gold coins that were currently in circulation, and Wang Man replaced them with four bronze denominations of purely nominal value. Round coins with values of 1 and 50 cash and larger, knife-shaped coins worth 500 and 5,000 cash, since Wang's 50 cash coins had only 1 20th the bronze per cash as his smallest coins did, and his 5,000 cash coins were minted with proportionally even less, the effect was to substitute feudatory currency for a Han Dynasty gold standard. Surprisingly, the effects of these changes were felt not just in Han or Xin China, but Imperial Rome as well. Emperor Augustus was forced to ban the purchase of expensive imported silks with that what had become, mysteriously, from the Roman point of view, irreplaceable gold coins. With hindsight, we know where those gold coins went, into the new imperial treasury. These bronze coins that Wang Man introduced were easily counterfeited, which then inflated prices for goods, which didn't bode well for anyone. So now on the list. Who has Wang Man pissed off? Nobles, merchants, farmers, and the Romans. So it was a shame for Wang Man. He was trying his best to make things better, and things just kept getting worse for the dude. Land reforms had backfired, monetary reforms had backfired. He has pretty much annoyed everyone close to him. What else could possibly go wrong? An earthquake? A flood? Oh great, there was an earthquake, and the Yellow River changed course again, which was resulted in another flood, again. So, if you were in any doubt, who has one man managed to piss off since he's in power? Everyone. Yes, everyone.
It was at this stage that everyone, or more or less everyone, turned against Wang Man, and rebellions sprung up everywhere. One of the most famous of these rebellions were the Chu Mei Jing, or in other words, the Red Eyebrows. Now, where does the name come from? It comes from one of the battles against Wang Man and the leaders. Unsure on how to tell who was fighting who, the rebels came up with the idea to paint their eyebrows red so they know who was who. Surely different coloured clothes would do? Why the eyebrows? I mean, I guess it's a psychological weapon, right? If I was in the Imperial Army, I would stop to look a minute and go, wait a minute, that dude's got red eyebrows. Regardless, after sending his forces against the rebels, the Imperial Army under Wang Man were completely destroyed and Chang'an was the target of the rebels. What didn't help the Imperial Army was that they didn't have any self-discipline. So literally burned down homes and treated the locals so poorly. So the people, who had nothing to do with the war, decided to join and aid the rebels. By the time the year 23 was coming around, Wang Wang knew his time was up. But rather than trying to run away, he stayed in the capital and met his fate. It seems though that Wang Wang decided to leave the humble life behind and chased the most basics of human pleasures with his final few weeks left. He even sent magicians to his palace to perform spells on him and according to some sources, he even took drugs during this time. Now I don't know what drugs were in Imperial China at the time, but you know, I can't really blame the guy. It's summed up nicely here by Numisicist, a guy who collects coins, Rob Tai. He said, Such excesses seemed out of character for one, a Confucian scholar and renowned ascetic. Frankly, my own assessment is that he was high on drugs for most of the period. Tai writes, Knowing all was lost, he chose to escape reality, seeking a new, few last beats of pleasure. Frankly, I agree with Rob here. If I knew I only had a few weeks left to live and I was an emperor, I'm pretty sure I'd do my very best to get as far away from reality as possible. However, the short-lived Xing Dynasty started with Wang Man's usurpation of power in 9 CE and ended with his death in the year 23. The 14 years in power can be divided roughly in half, with the first 8 years of his rule with a pursuit of reforms and the final six years characterised by fighting rebellions. It is said that when rebels stormed into the imperial palace and killed Wang Mang, they cut his body to pieces. And worse, one source even said that someone cut his tongue out and then ate it. This turns me to the final part of this episode. Was Wang Mang China's first socialist as he has been claimed to be? Or was he a power-hungry usurper that he is depicted to be? It's actually rather difficult to say, to be honest. The reason being is the lack of sources. No primary sources really say why he usurped power, just that he did. But the restored Han Dynasty, which we'll discuss in a later episode, did their very best to make Wang Mang out to be a horrible usurper of power. He is known as one of the first Xiaoren, like I mentioned earlier, and that is villain. He is just behind Zhao Gao, and if you remember Zhao Gao, he is the eunuch that completely destroyed the Qin Dynasty just before the Han. But I mean, is this reputation deserved for Wang Man? Like, Zhao Gao definitely deserves his reputation, but does, does Wang Man deserve it? Hu Xu, a Chinese diplomat and scholar in the early to mid 20th century, published a study giving Wang Man a bit of a better reputation. For example, he said Wang Man wasn't at fault but it was the Han Dynasty, as they had produced a bunch of incompetent rulers to oversee the dynasty. A usurpation was inevitable. Furthermore, speaking of the usurpation of power from Wang Mang, it was a peaceful one. The first one ever in Chinese history. And to be honest, I think it's only one of two? Maybe three at push. Sure, he tried some radical reforms that seemed to help the working man, so to speak, so it could be argued that he was a socialist, but ultimately, the reforms he tried to pursue backfired spectacularly, which angered the subjects of the empire he took over. I guess we will never know Wang Mang's true intentions when it comes to the reforms he pursued and what kind of a person he truly was. 
Did he see himself as a messenger of heaven to sort out the mess that those under it found themselves in? Or was he really just a power-hungry tyrant who's seen an opportunity? This is the beauty of history sometimes. I guess we will never know. But that mean, that doesn't mean that we can't guess, right? What do you think of Wanda? Feel free to let me know. And that, my friends, is a wrap for today's episode. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you have, please feel free to leave a comment somewhere on my Facebook or Instagram. And just to let you know, next week I'm going to discuss, so I'm going to kind of backpedal a bit, and we're going to discuss the Silk Road and its significance for China. Just because I've not really discussed it, I just mentioned it in passing. But now it's time to give it an episode of its own. So I hope you look forward to that, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening.